Hot damn. I don't even know what to say. It's so weird. <laughs> everything's everything's weird because like there's no audience here. We're not we're not we didn't start off with a rockin' tune. Yeah. Uh, we're we're just launching right into the show. This is the first time we've been able to do a proper banked episode. Oh hi, it's me, Brian Brushwood <laughs> in Austin, Texas. Joined by my BFF right here in AUS. It's JRY. What's going on, Justin Robert Young? Oh my god, Brian. Everything's normal. <laughs> this is the really most weird. normal moment. We're <laughs> definitely not in the middle of the day. But I'll tell you what is delightful is that I am sitting next to the radiating presence that is focused in the point of his majestic buccaneer beard of C. Robert Cargill. How you doing? It's a wizard beard. I was about to say, man, I, dude writes one blockbuster movie about a space wizard. Now, all of a sudden, he has to look like Gandalf. Look, I, you know, I was talking to somebody, and they said, you know, if you grow it out and you get a right point, you get plus 10 to sorcery checks. So, uh, I am just... And now, here we are. <laughs> and, and, and you realize, okay, we have to resist the temptation to make this the beard talk hour. Where, where can, right, can, can we start with the beard talk intro? Yes, and I'll, I'll start by saying uh, I have completely abdicated any trimming or grooming of my beard like once once you make it a habit to go to a barbershop and you have a pro handle it yeah. like never again I, I will never manage any of this on my own it's it's kind of it's kind of amazing when when you go and let somebody just just go look uh, do something with yeah. me yeah right? make, make this not look awful yeah and, wait so uh, do we all go Two barbers to this, trim this and is, manage our this beards. This is what I was asking. We are we are well, we are uh, I, men of a certain means. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Hollywood screenwriter, so I go to my. <laughs> I don't go to a barber. I go to my stylist. Sure, ah. sure, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so, I, I, how, how often do you you get stuff fixed up? Uh, I'm I'm like a if I can remember, it's by the month. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, I'll do the hair and, and beard I think all the in, most all I, in one. the most I do is I is I shave clean the the under thing. But but I need one of them oh, no, 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 no. to I, define no, I, the I, line. I, I, I have to shave all the cheeks because I have what uh, I've colloquially referred to as the race to the eyeballs. <laughs> uh, that will just it'll slowly creep up. Uh, there, if I don't uh, find the you line got the, and shave you it, you got the man whiskers. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no, and they're like, and they're weird and they're scraggly yeah. and like you know. a, like another two inches. You get to uh, uh, go on tour, call yourself the Dog Boy. Sure, <laughs> yeah, no, it, and it's just like I don't know. It, it, it's like it's like the White Walkers climbing the wall. Like, yeah, they're just like gross and weird and making their way. Uh, it is. Ever it upward. feels like wrong to shave your under your eyeballs. <laughs> like <laughs> it does. And then the weird thing is when you nick yourself, and then all of a sudden it looks like you gave yourself the weirdest black eye of all time because. <laughs> Just one little purple dot. Do, uh, do you let them shave your eyebrows? Oh God, yeah. yeah you see, I, oh, I've that's never. The truth. Uh, like, you, yeah, you're on that, right? Oh yeah. No, oh yeah. Having them trim the eyebrows. Uh, so, so uh, that happened without consent the first time, and it was deeply like I, I didn't know that was a thing, and then all of a sudden there's just a, a, a comb, and they're going, blah, 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 and I'm like, what is happening? You're, they're making you look good. That's what they're doing. Well, yes. It's much better than doing it yourself, and you, you start to notice as people get older, they get those wild, like yes. untamed eyebrows. And it's like, oh, you know, you, you can trim those, and you know what? They include it as part of your haircut. <laughs> Although, so. Although there is like a like James Randi makes it like a statement like he he, he has majestic giant elven uh, wizard eyebrows yeah yeah well no he's yeah he's got those Asimovs those those those, those big gigantic so uh, are they, is that their name for them or? I mean now there is <laughs> <laughs> put it in the Urban Dictionary <laughs> see he, and, and it, it's 2019 you never go full Asimov no That's no <laughs> no 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 not I mean not these days I mean uh, now I, I I can't believe we shared so much in common with I, this, I, I, but, but this and that I didn't thing. know that about it uh, anyway hey man uh, uh, so we're recording this as we're basking in the afterglow of the uh, Avengers Endgame experience so so we, we know this is in the future you guys are probably over it but I figured like just just to start us off talking rad comic stuff uh, I, I, I'm assuming you were a fan oh yeah oh yeah no I was uh, I was there opening night I was supposed to actually see it two times that weekend but both of the other second times got nipped in the butt because I had to travel out to LA and then Scott got sick on the day he and I had tickets to go see it so um but yeah no I fell in love with it I, I need to watch it a couple more times to really kind of put a whole mess of the things together uh but man was it an experience and it was just it was a surreal experience in a lot of ways yeah, well, I mean, I guess the, the the biggest thing that I was shocked by was that it surprised me. 
Like I, I, I had no idea that that, that, mo- that that movie, like a movie that you've literally been building to, for that to also be a surprise 15 minutes in was just such a treat. I was like, I have no idea where we're going at do, this yeah, point. Do, do we think the statute of limitations has expired and we can actually talk about anything about the movie? On three weeks? Yeah. I, yeah, think, so. I think we're fine. I that, think that, so. that, uh, for, uh, two, the first big surprise with the, with the, like just 20 minutes of post 9 11 was amazing. And then th- that five years later was, well, that was the first like truly big surprise. And and there's this moment because oftentimes. Well, I mean, you- to, to me, uh, uh, Thanos getting his head lopped off was was where I'm like, oh, okay, I guess <laughs> I, we've killed Thanos. I I love that Thanos was like, all right, I've killed half the universe. I'm gonna retire and become a melon farmer. I know, yeah, I'm but a simple farmer. It ain't much, but it's honest work. I'm I mean, Thanos. Yeah, I, I think that's part of what we adored about the character Thanos is because he seemed he was represented in Infinity War as somebody with the courage of his convictions, and that's exactly what I would expect him to do. It's like he did the thing. Like I don't care. You know, the only thing after this is uh, I guess I live out my life. But but the there's this moment because you. We see the previews, the trailers to movies that almost always is the entire first act of, yeah. of a movie. And then there's this brief moment when you're watching the movie and you realize I no longer have any information that came from the trailers that could be of service. And then that's when I am just super delighted. And and for me, that, that five years later moment was like, I now have absolutely have no, no idea. Because they definitely didn't go up into space in the spacesuits that they showed in the trailer and so all I know is that at some point they get into the spacesuits that are also a hoodie that's been advertised to me on Instagram. It's one of the amazing things about what Kevin and the crew have done uh, over the years in that they've built such a strong brand that they um, that audiences trust the brand. And so they're, they give you these nice, big, sweeping, epic trailers that tell you nothing and have no spoilers. Like you get to that point where you realize, oh, wait. This is a time travel movie. This isn't a let's go get Thanos movie. This is a movie about going back in time to get the stones because the stones no longer. I have no idea where this movie's going, and I'm here for it. And it is, it is always a delightful treat, and it's something that they've done because every movie in Phase Three is great. Um, yeah. There is not a single clunker in Phase Three. There's not a single movie that people are like, "Well, what about that <laughs> one?" Uh, uh, bold policy, Cotton. <laughs> so, uh, you and I might have a difference of opinion. Oh, which Justin? Do you have any public opinions about this? Nope. <laughs> is not that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> not today, Satan. <laughs> no, I didn't know. I didn't know there was a Phase Three movie that you guys didn't like. Uh, we've talked. We, we, we beat have it no to public d- opinion on one Phase Three movie because I like my Twitter account. Uh, there, uh, there was definitely. <laughs> one movie that was a little bit like sitting down to watch somebody else play a video game and the first thing I do is do all the unlock codes so that there's no stakes uh, and, and no threats to the main character and no and no repercussions in the universe that I was not a fan of. Okay, well we'll talk about that off mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, on the other hand, love all of them and uh, um, no, I applaud your opinions. Yeah, no, I, I, I've, I've really, I've very much enjoyed all of them. You know, there's some I enjoy more than others, clearly. Yeah. But every, the thing is, is every movie in th- Phase Three is considered a good movie, and it's uh, that the audiences love it. Well, so, and, and and they really stepped their game up specifically in terms of uh, the the villains. I think took a quantum leap in in Phase Three. The uh, uh, there's a lot of the tropes of the first phases of like it's all going to end with a big glowing light in the sky and uh, well, some the, punchy punch well, like that the, was great. Well, but what it is is it's it's not just an evolution of Marvel. It's that you know the at the end of Phase Two was when the Marvel Creative Committee got disbanded and Kevin Feige no longer had someone to report to. Kevin Feige yeah. was the you know the end all be all, and so and Kevin's policy was I'm going to get genius. Uh, creative talents. In fact, he mined the way Jason Blum mined, where he's like, and, and here's- actually, it, 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 let's just reset for folks who are not aware that the Marvel Creative Committee, like Kevin Feige, used to report to somebody else above yeah, him, and fi- then it was they, five- would, they would have final say on it. It was stuff. a five member committee, and they, you know, I think Joe Casada was on it, Avi Arad. It was all people who were Marvel bigwigs in the past or Disney bigwigs. Um, and they oversaw, and they had final say over all sorts of scripts and they would come down with weird notes like one of the stories I told recently on my podcast was when we were working on Doctor Strange and I want you to process this for a moment Yeah, we're working on Doctor Strange uh-huh. and one of the edicts that comes down is well we don't like the phrase time travel so we don't want any time travel <laughs> involved 
in this movie. Now you can deal with possibilities. Yeah. But we don't want there to be any time travel. And so I I wrote this two page thing in the getting into a scene that's all explaining about possibilities and branches and 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 temporal manipulation and entropy and things like that. And then the Marvel Creative Committee got to span it and I get a note going, Hey, can we just cut these two pages and uh Did you use say the word, the word time travel? Time travel. <laughs> and I'm like, What happened? And I'm like, Oh, that was a committee note. Um so gotcha. once we were able to say time travel, now we have endgame, which is nothing but time which travel. Is a time travel. Movie, but, yeah. but it really was, I mean, the, the Marvel creative, all the things that people used to complain about the Marvel movies that have changed, if you draw a straight line, you could see all those things change as soon as the creative committee gets disbanded. And, and and you know, um, that company has just done so much with that. They, they you know, uh, everyone is is pushed to create something new and different. And they, they all the things that everyone complains about are the things that they're complaining about and trying to figure out and trying to conquer and trying to figure out, you know, the villain problem, you know? Yeah. It was very hard for them to figure out the, you know, solve the villain problem because the real villain problem with Marvel was up until recently, you if you asked people to compile a list of the 10 best villains in the Marvel Universe, nine of them were owned by Fox. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. You're looking at Doctor Doom. You're looking Magneto. at Magneto. You're you know uh, yeah. all those great villains. Um, and then the other the other uh, one and then five uh, in the ten through twenty category were owned by Sony because they're Spider Man. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so you know they they were like, how do we make these characters as epic as you know the, the, those villains? And they've really solved it, and they've really kind of figured out how to make it work. And uh, and they've made just so many great films. And then this was this is the final bit of you know they, Kevin's saying it's not it's the not it, it's not the last phase three movie that Homecoming's technically the last phase sure, three yeah, movie. Sure, yeah, like a uh, But this is the big send off. This is the big bow of this is how this used to work, and now it's going to work in a completely different manner. And which that that to me is the biggest flop your dick on the table move for Marvel is that it was such a graduation moment. Yes, like it was not. There wasn't a post credit scene where you're going to tip your hat to maybe where we're going. There was it's so much finality there. The, yeah, there were a few threads that obviously we're going to be interested to follow going forward. But by and large, this was like, and we're done. So the next thing that starts is going to have such a a, a big shoes to fill because mm -hmm. th th this feels like an end of an epic. But also, it can do whatever it wants. And, and I'm excited to see it. Well, and I mean, I remember, I remember walking out of Thor. We had an advanced screening of Thor here in town. And, uh, you know, all the Ain't It Cool guys walked out together and we were talking. And I said, man, if they can continue to make this work like this, if we can get more of these movies, could you imagine like 10 years from now? And it was so weird that I said it 10 years from now. If we could get an Infinity War movie with Thanos and the Infinity Stones and all the heroes from all the movies kind of coming together and playing their part. And everyone went, man, that would be cool, but it's never going to happen. Right. And to have that, not only have it happen, but have played a small part in it. Yeah. To yeah have... And now that you've hunted them all down one by one so you can Nelson laugh in their face. <laughs> like... <laughs> I said, ha, ha. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's uh, to have been able to play a part of that, to watch this movie and see my fingerprints in a few scenes, you know, to see them take th things, ideas I had written and build upon that and work that in and make reference to it to see Tilda again. Um, that was, oh, that, that was, that was, great that was, that was the big, that was the big moment. And that, I was, I was, I was thinking of you the entire time. Cause I'm like, I know that this character is so personal to Cargill and, to watch, there was so much, uh, you know, all these time travel little vignettes were all these, okay, well, what if these people met these people, either in terms of the mythology or in the case of the ancient one, it was like, all right, well, what if the galaxy brain of Bruce Banner, who now is in this new enlightened place, meets the ultimate galaxy brain of, of the ancient one? And knowing that you had set that up, I was just so, so pumped to watch it play out. It was it was very surreal watching it. In fact, what was the most surreal part was I was watching it in the same theater that I saw a lot of these in, but I specifically saw Winter Soldier in. I was sitting in the same seat, same theater. It's my, fa it's my favorite theater in town. It's my favorite seat in that theater in town. I love watching movies there. And I was sitting there and I realized while they're doing the pre-show, the, the, the Marvel, uh, 
Draft House tried to get Michael Pena to come in and do the complete history oh, of wow. the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and they couldn't get him. But uh, so they did something similar to it, where they yeah. they showed clips from every movie and did, gave the basic rundown of the plot. And we get to Winter Soldier, and it dawns on me. Oh my God, this is the very seat I was sitting in the first time I heard that scene on the rooftop where they go, Dr. Stephen Strange. And I started clapping like a kid on oh, that's hilarious. And my wife just looks over and goes, What? What was that? And I said, They're going to make a Dr. Strange movie. <laughs> and I was so excited with no idea that I would ever even be considered for that. It was a dream I had when I was 13 years old to write a Doctor Strange movie and had no idea that I would then become a part of that and um, and then create these ideas and these scenes that would then filter out through four or five other Phase 3 movies and I would see you know, stuff that I wrote referenced, you know, that whole big, you know, thing of him looking forward in time with the time stills. And I'm like, I came up with that. That's great. <laughs> that was my idea. That's awesome. And he's using it to solve Infinity War. Holy shit. I mean, he's, it's the namesake. The namesake of like the biggest movie of all time yeah. is him directly doing that. Yeah. And so it's, um, uh, it was it, it was really crazy to have that experience and, and to have it bookended in such a wonderful way uh, to where, um, uh, no matter what the future holds, I'm like I, I've had I've run that gamut. I what? went from geeky fanboy about this and, and, to being participant of this to being able to look at other people having built upon that and creating something I'm madly in love with. And, and I know you're talking about it from the aspect of being somebody who had a hand in the creation of it, but I feel that even just as a fan, like like they there could be no more Marvel movies, I'd be a okay with that. Uh, eighth grade Brian would be happy as a clam with everything that we got so 23 far. Twenty three perfect film. Well, all right, so <laughs> <laughs> many perfect many films. Perfect what uh, a shockingly high batting average. <laughs> a, 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 a Hall high. of Fame batting average. Yes. Uh yeah. Um it's uh but man, dude, you know, you know, it's one of those things where so many so many of those films have become my regular rewatches. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I watch I watch Ragnarok a ridiculous amount of times. It holds up to so many repeat viewings. It really it is. It is ecstasy, man. It, it, it is the a comedic masterpiece. It is, and and really, it's the it's the first. It's the a new hope of the trilogy of of Thor Ragnarok, uh, Infinity War, and then uh, Endgame. Like that, it, if you could watch just those three, and I feel like get a fine complete. Well, experience. and it was just you know if you look at who is now out of the picture in terms of. Chris Evans as Captain America and Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, really Ragnarok just so effortlessly rebooted, you know, uh, it, Hemsworth and Thor that now it's like Hemsworth almost exclusively does comedies now. Uh, uh, th that character is so comedic and it plugged in so effortlessly into the Guardians universe that now that's like, okay, well now we just get two funny space action adventure comedy franchises. And now it's like, I couldn't imagine... That that it's like okay, and now Thor dies too. It's like no, that would suck. Like we we barely got uh, yeah, the, like, the beginning of our new adventures right, we, of Thor. We, we finally just met uh, Thor two point oh. Yeah. Uh, you mean the big Thorbowski? Oh my God! That that is that that was one moment that that bummed me out that they called it out by name because like like when I realized oh my God they're gonna do him as the big Lebowski and then they they're like by the way we're doing the big Lebowski I was like God why did you do that it was I was already on board. Yeah, but some people need to have it spelled out. Yeah, I guess. And also, it's like you know, you're you're you're, you're trying to write the final Robert Downey Jr. Iron I, Man quips. I, <laughs> yeah. I will point out that is a running thing of the Russos. They have done that in several of the previous films. Uh, if you look at Infinity War, Infinity War has four or five moments stolen whole hog out yeah. of Flash Gordon. Uh, oh my gosh! Like Wait. taken from Flash Gordon, and then. Uh, they actually have that moment where they refer to uh, Star Lord as Flash Gordon. Like they actually, like they often will reference the things that they're doing. Yeah. Uh, and I guess they did the same thing with with, with like explaining in terms of like uh, this is not Back to the Future two and all that stuff. They, uh, uh, I, 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 I understand why they would do that. That that is a good defensive maneuver because you can't be accused of stealing anything if you cite it. it yeah, no, it's, you go. Yeah. it's like that movie Happy Death Day. You know, uh, Happy Death Day. You're like, oh, we're doing Groundhog Day. They, somebody, yeah. It, yeah, and then it's like, okay, yeah, no, I'm in. All right, it acknowledges Groundhog Day exists in this universe. All right, let's go with the time loop. And they did something new and different with it. It's the the thing with Infinity War. That, like, what I love is I watch Flash Gordon religiously. Oh, it's great. It, it is one. It is, of, it is one of the. And I wonder how much of our affection just happens to 
to be with us being of the right age and it hitting HBO at the right time where we just saw it over and over and over you know, again. That, that's a big part of it. But the other thing is there really is a lot of amazing stuff there that is not in any other movie. But the thing is, is that I watch that religiously. I love it. So I noticed every little flourish that they borrowed from Lash Gordon. And yet the Russos did it better every freaking time. So I, I'm like, OK, yeah, no, I'm, I, I'll allow it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll go judge Mills Lane on it. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. No, I love Flash. In fact, there's a really great documentary called Life After Flash. Oh, about Sam. What's his name? The, the well, Sam actor? Jones, and then um, uh, also about the making of. So, 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 so I'm sure you knew all this because you watched the documentary. I w- I was crestfallen to find out that that entire movie that's not his voice the <laughs> the entire time no long. no. In fact, and, that's that's the uh, that was. Uh, he his his voice was redubbed. Yep. Uh, and uh, so he his voice isn't in the movie. As as I understand, it, it wasn't even redubbed because I was like, what did he do to piss someone off that they that they changed his voice for A the lot. entire movie? But. <laughs> <laughs> the, the version that I read recently was that he wouldn't go out because this is back in the days where everything was ADR. Yeah. Like, like there was no microphone small enough uh, for you to uh, get decent audio yeah. with the, uh, with the film. So he, there was some session, like they had a bunch of it done, but he, he, he couldn't make his schedule work for, for a chunk of it. And it was a big enough chunk he, chunk that they were like, fuck it, just to replace. No, all no, no. Of it. He, he claims that that's not true. Oh, that, really? That that's their defense. But really what it was, was he pissed off the director. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the Dino director. De Laurentiis? No. Well, that's the producer. Oh, Oh, got it. And of course, the, it's an Italian production, so the Italians always did that. So that way, they would just have the film, and then they would have the different people in different languages dub the do the, everything all at once. Yeah, and in fact, the old Italian films, how they used to make them, is the Americans would say their lines in English, and the Italians would say their lines in Italian, and they would just dub them over. So yeah, wow. No, they had, it's like all the the like spaghetti the, the westerns. spaghetti westerns. Yeah, that's, that's all, why yeah. The, yeah, the, there's there's no like native tongue version of those movies yeah. because everything on some level is, is redone. Yeah. But so, uh, yeah, that movie, but there's so much of that movie that came together that's magical from Queen's score yeah, to several of the performances to the amazing... Brian Blessed? Oh, well, Brian Blessed. Steals oh the damn show. Oh, and steals the show in the documentary. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I, oh, okay, I've got to say... Yeah, no, no, like, there's a, there's a five-minute scene in the documentary with Brian May just going through how they came up with the music for Flash Gordon and he's just playing on the piano and he just starts going, dun, 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 dun. And it's like, Oh my god! Oh, awesome. oh my god! Uh, yeah, no, it is such a it's a wonderful documentary. Definitely check that out. Um, I but yeah, we uh, I talked uh, uh, I, I I lobbied very hard. Fantastic Fest to bring that movie. I said get that movie and then immediately follow it up with a thirty five millimeter showing Flash of Flash Gordon. He goes and I remember one of my friends going, yeah. Uh, but we've shown Flash Gordon. I said, have you done it with Sam? Because he'll come out for both. And they were like, what? Oh. So, what so the thing is, what I was going to mention is at the Chattanooga Film Festival, I, I introduced the documentary, the world premiere. They, they knew I was a huge Flash Gordon fan and asked if I would come out and intro it. And so I did. And then what we did is at the Chattanooga Film Festival, we occasionally do these live script reads. And so we did a live script read of Flash Gordon Uh, with Sam Jones doing his own voice. That's awesome. (laughs) How how, how close is Sam Jones's actual voice to the one we hear? Pretty close. Yeah. I mean, they they essentially, nobody knows exactly who it is, but um, uh, Peter Wingard was pretty certain he knew who it was. He just couldn't remember the guy's name, but it was a voice actor at the time who did a lot of cartoons. And so they brought in a guy who sounded similar to do that voice. Right, and somebody it, who's a voice actor is going to be able to match the tone and cadence of, yeah, of all the... So, yeah, so that's pretty much what they're... But, but so I got to do a live script read with Sam Jones sitting next to Flash Gordon, where of course... I'll tell you what, man, that it, feels like a property that's ripe for a, a reboot. They keep trying, and, and they... Uh, um, uh, uh, Breck Eisner had it last I heard and wasn't able to get it off the ground. Uh, but yeah, it's that's something that they. It, it, it seems like one of those properties, like like John Carter of Mars, though, where it's like it, it's been so built upon, it was so influential for for so many different reasons that if you were to just do it straight out, you'd be like, oh, this is like these other. Yeah. Movies that I love. Yeah, and and people would at this point be like, oh, so it's like Guardians of the Galaxy without the Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. Okay, yeah. fine. But, but, but I could see it, you know, like as a Netflix original that's set in a high school or something, and you don't even go to space. You just go to, you know, something I that would, represents space. I whatever. would love it if they, like, if you did something like Netflix where it was a ser- it was serialized. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so, like, and they would. Yeah, if you could build on it and, and, and expand the universe or just go full 
like, oh no, we're just gonna do a, another super campy version of it. So like, you you love yeah. Flash Gordon for what it <laughs> the, the, is. The, the, I'm just remembering there's so many things that that would never in a million years happen nowadays. Like the 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 sly implication that Ming bangs his daughter. <laughs> like <laughs> like it's a uh, uh, oh oh that's well the thing is the original when we did the script read they got the only script registered with the uh, with the. Uh, Library of the Congress, oh, okay. ah. the Library of Congress, and that draft is nothing like what the film is. Oh, and it, <laughs> that's like it's a... it's even more like there's a uh, there is a moment where Dale Arden kicks an Amazon off Flash Gordon and says, "Get off my man, you lesbian bitch, you oh, dyke bitch!" Jeez, wow. And, and, <laughs> and at one point, Sam leaned over and said, "Cargill, did you rewrite this?" I mean, <laughs> he's like, "I've never seen this draft of the script. Is, is this a put on? Did you?" And I'm like, yeah. "Dude, no, no." And I'm I'm so here. For this, uh, that's what it was like in the early days of the internet. I remember there was a, a, a leaked, or maybe maybe not even leaked, just, just a published original script for being John Malkovich that that bore no resemblance to the actual movie that I had just seen. Like a, a complete with a, a intelligent chimpanzee that knows sign language and lives in the sewers. Uh, I mean, it's like pretty pretty far off. Yeah, no, there's it, it, that happens a lot. I mean, in development, movies change a lot. I'm working on a project right now that we have. We had three drafts of a script already, and we're like, oh, here it is. And then the head of the studio said, no, this is the movie I really want. And we went, oh, well, that's a page one rewrite, but that, that'll be awesome. So And so when once that movie gets made, if it gets made and out there, there will be these drafts that people will be like, it's this crazy shit here. Like, this yeah. is this script is bonkers and is nothing like this movie. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, I mean, that happens a lot. Um, yeah, I, I, wasn't there a, a you you know more about the story than I do, but wasn't there didn't didn't Kevin Smith work on a? I think we've even talked about this on the show. Superman. No, yeah, and then and then it turned into the, like somebody wanted a giant spider, and then uh, Wild Wild John, Wild got made. John yeah. Peters is that who it was? It was a producer at the right. time. Uh, no, in fact, I have a great side story for that. No, uh, yeah, no, he was writing. It was the one that was supposed to be. It was the Tim Burton. Superman, right? Yeah, and he yeah. was, and and this guy really wanted a giant mechanical spider, so he had to put it in the script. And of course, that movie didn't get made, so his next movie, Wild Wild West, had a giant, had a mechanical, giant mechanical spider. spider. <laughs> and in fact, at the time, I mean, let's go back in time in the Wayback Machine. I'm talking. Uh, let's go back to the heady days of 1999. I'm a 24-year-old video store clerk. I am at my first writers convention and I meet a writer who intru- uh, uh, who realizes I'm a young writer I don't know anybody and decides he's going to show everybody around he's like have you met Neil so he introduces me to Neil Gaiman right as wow. he's on his ascent to rock stardom and uh, but they, so so at the time they probably called him the Sandman guy or, or whatever well, well people you know people in the industry knew him people in comics knew him but he wasn't he wasn't the huge household name yet his yeah. his books had sold well but were not like the monster Super hits Nova, that, yeah. that they are now. So he was still, you know, he could still be doing a reading at a thing and it would fill a room over here in a hotel thing, but it, it wasn't the people lined up for a mile to right. meet him like it is nowadays, which is why he had to stop doing signings. But so we end up, he invites me to join him at the bar after his panels. And so me and this guy and, uh, um, and this, this is when you when you are just a, a total fanboy mode. Right? I am, yeah, I'm just a young pup fanboy, right. and um, uh, and we're sitting talking, and I, and the thing is, is Neil zeroed in on me because he had, was just getting into Hollywood, he was just doing meetings and such, and nobody knew the people he was talking about, mm-hmm. and so he'd be like, uh, uh. He's like, oh, well, yeah, I, I would, I'd say, what's up with Sandman? He goes, oh, well, you know, I just met with a director. Uh, do you know the movie Pi? I'm like, oh, you're talking about Aronofsky. And he goes, oh, wow. yeah, Darren Aronofsky. So we were, we met with him last week. What did you, you know, what was it like? And he's like, I told him not to do it. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, why? Do you not want Sandman to happen? And he goes, Cargill, have you seen Wild Wild West? Uh, and I said, yeah. He goes, those are the producers. <laughs> and oh, I'm like, man. I was like, I actually just told Neil this story a few weeks ago, and and he laughed because he's like, "Oh my god, I remember that was you." <laughs> ah, that's great. So yeah, uh, but he uh, yeah, it was um, uh, uh, yeah. So it's very weird how the development process goes on things. In fact, I when working on Doctor Strange, uh, we have the only time in WGA history for a movie to have two different arbitrations. You're only you are only supposed to ever have one arbitration. I, I don't even know what arbitration. Okay, is. so arbitration is. Yeah. This. Uh, um, 
Uh, uh, you guys were worried we weren't going to be able to fill time. <laughs> <laughs> no, arbitration is this. Arbitration is um, the process in which the guild oversees who gets credit on a movie. Now, generally, if you write a script uh, uh, and somebody rewrites it, you know, and rewrites enough of it, there's no arbitration. You know, uh, a movie like Sinister never went through arbitration because me and Scott wrote it. We're the only ones ever to touch it. That's the way it goes. You know, uh, Sinister 2 got re-altered by the director and in the process, but the director did not want any credit on the uh, the film for having written it. Um, but with Doctor Strange... Because, because this is where all the money, like, eventually... If there's like credit and money is determined by whose yes. name is on it, because and so that, that's why like the the guild has to come in and say where are the sheriffs, we're yes. going to decide this is this person wrote it and it's going to be in this order and that's that's the determination. And essentially, what how it works is it's a three person blind panel. You don't know who they are. They don't know who you are. You are writer A, writer B, writer C, right? And they have to read all the drafts of the script and you write a letter arguing your. Uh, your case for credit and then they sit down they watch the final film they read the scripts they read any source materials that are given in and they make their determination what a bizarre job and all of this like I understand that there's money down the road for having your name be on the screen or not on the screen but but uh, but 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 in the moment we're talking about uh, a, a label that yeah, no no it's it's like a vast amount of money it's if yeah. your name if you did a year's worth of work on that film but you don't get your name on it you get zero residuals if you have a deal as as many of the the studios make that if this movie gets made and has your name on it, you get a bonus of sometimes it's in the millions. So um, uh, yeah, so these are these are like is, life and death situations. And also, this it's is, like, am I going to be able to buy a house next year or not? Money, like, yeah, and, and and also it's like career boost wise. Yeah, it, it, it's all the difference between like, oh, okay, I spent all this time doing this. Well, and, and, and now like I'm able to make my next thing I because get, I'm the guy who did. This movie. I mean, maybe unscripted is different or whatever, but like when it came to to doing hacking the system, it was it, it was not a, there was no money whether my name was listed as, Un, as uh, producer uh, or, non, non, or non unscripted work. is yeah. radically yeah. different. Yeah. It's non union. Yeah. But so here's where things got crazy. So we had uh, a couple people who lobbied for credit, even though they knew they shouldn't get it. Um, and uh, but the thing is, is we had to go to arbitration because anytime a number of writers work on it and the director has their name on as a writing credit then it automatically triggers arbitration so someone else doesn't have to do it. So there's no there's no public shaming or anything like that. So we went through arbitration and we lobbied, we believed, we, we, I did the math and uh, John Spates had done just enough work that we believed he qualified for credit and according to the guild, he was just over the line, let's, let's lobby together and the three of us lobbied together for credit, joint credit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got it. Uh, and so arbitration done, but it's a lot of work. You know, you, you you have to read a lot of scripts. You have to write a letter making your case. You know, it was 72 hours of me downing coffee, just bringing me cup after cup while I'm pouring over In your this. mind, you're full on Perry Masoning this shit. Yeah. It's like, yeah. then you might. I, I have, I have a draft. If you read the script, you must have quit. Exactly. <laughs> There's a... just one thing that doesn't make sense with the other arbitration claim. I have a final draft of Doctor Strange at home that has been has six different highlighter colors to it because it's everybody's own stuff because uh, I literally went through PC okay this person wrote this in this draft and that stayed here so she gets this color and then I w went through and then tallied it up and um uh, uh, you know, most of the thing is is me, Scott and Spates. So um so it's like yeah, this is the case. So movie comes out. Yeah. And we've got credit. Awesome. Done. Great. Um 3 weeks later I get a phone call. And it's the WGA. And they said, hey, we've got something really weird. Um, have you ever heard of Bob Gale? And I'm like, yeah, legendary screenwriter, wrote Back to the Future. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he said that he wrote a draft of this back in the 80s and that you used a bunch of it for the film. And I was like, wait, what? And, and uh, this is on which film again? Doctor Strange. Doctor okay, Strange. Okay. So here's what became weird was... They, you know, talked to Marvel and Marvel said, yeah, that was, um, yeah, the Marvel developed a Doctor Strange film in the, um, in the eighties and lost the rights to it. And so as a result, we, uh, um, 
uh, you know, we lost chain of custody of those scripts. We didn't, we don't have them on file. We didn't use any of them. And they said, yeah, so here's what happened. Uh, so they developed a Doctor Strange movie for eight years. Marvel did. And then they sold the rights when, when Marvel went bust with the junk bonds thing. Is that the, like Professor Morpheus uh, thing is where it is? Uh, Dr. Mordred? Yeah. <laughs> so Dr. So, um, uh, uh, Charles Band gets the rights to Doctor Strange, writes a Doctor Strange movie for Jeffrey Combs, then doesn't pay attention to the the way it's the thing is worded, loses the rights, <laughs> cuts out everything that was specifically referencing Doctor Strange, becomes a 75 minute movie, and they call it Doctor Mordred, and they shot it anyway. And um, so they lost the rights, and the rights floated around from place to place, but no one ever made it. And because animated doesn't count as, you know, with feature, uh, with the guild, uh, the animated Doctor Strange movie from 2007 didn't count. And because Marvel then reacquired the rights and Disney bought Marvel, Disney was now saddled with the 30-year development process of this and the chain of ownership. And so the first script was technically written by someone else and not John Spade. So John Spate shouldn't have gotten credit. Oh, and, shit. And so, but at the same time, Bob Gale was from a different era of screenwriting, and they changed the rules in the mid-aughts to how first credit and credit goes. So how it used to work was if you were the first person to write a movie, and you wrote a Doctor Strange movie, and you wrote Doctor Strange in it, and Mordo, and Clea, and The Ancient One, you got credit for those characters. Well, because of a big thing that happened with the movie Moby Dick, uh, the... Um, the uh, guild has now ruled that source outs, outside source material that you're adapting from doesn't count as yours. Like so, so if you wrote your own characters, yes, and then it was, uh, yeah, then you still get credit. But if you're taking other, if you're adapting stuff, you don't then, get credit for yeah. the stuff you're adapting. And so once that was, but the thing is, is what happened was that all these old screenwriters came out of the woodwork, going, "Oh well, before Bob Gale worked on it, I wrote the treatment. That was Lawrence Block." And then Larry Cohen's like, "Well, yeah, well, but I completely rewrote Gale's <laughs> script, and uh, and I see similarities in this and Stan Lee." The first person to actually, when when they went to him, the first thing Stan Lee goes, "Oh, this movie's nothing like mine. These kids, these kids, they uh, they really this, did they something. Wrote, they wrote they wrote this film, not me. I don't want to arbitrate on this. So Stan uh, backed out and and was totally on team us. And so we had to re-arbitrate. So I had to read oh shit every single draft written from 1983." Up until our uh, our draft uh, in 2016, and then write. And what we, me and Scott wanted to do is we're like, well, John technically shouldn't be credited on this the way this is working. Um, we're gonna fight for John anyway. Yeah. And so we 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 were like, no, we maintain the credit we argued was uh, John Spates wrote the first draft in this line of succession. We did not read any of these materials. We did not know that he existed. He is the first writer. He gets for, writes the first writer, and we're, we want to keep him on. And this script is ours, and it has nothing to do with any of these. And so, as a result, that's the credit that ended up staying. Uh, but but that, and, that's got to be a, a, a an ass cheek squeezer because, like, you're going up against like legends in in Hollywood, and like, like that stuff does count even in in those arbitrations. And you're right? talking about a movie that made seven hundred million dollars worldwide, yeah. and that's that is you know um, you know you sign on for. You know, especially with that film, I took less than I would normally get on other big films uh, because I knew that this movie's definitely getting made. And if my, my name's on it, that movie's going to be putting food on my table for the next 20 years. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, residuals di drop over time, but they still show up in the if, whenever it shows up on TNT. Um, you know, that's it is a, the closest uh, parallel I, I have is in YouTube, you know, the YouTube algorithm, you know, at various times favors various projects. And uh, now that now that um, now that everything is under one umbrella, then all of those those checks come to me. And it's wild. Like like just one day, suddenly you get triple the normal amount. And then and yeah. it, it, no explanation why. The, it, oh. And it's an old video from, uh, you know, five years ago. Yeah, like, no, it's oh, it's oh, it's super weird. Yeah, that, that the, my residual statement is exactly like that, where it's like, oh, I guess Sinister played in Bulgaria somewhere. So I got 400 bucks. Right. Great. Dope. Um, uh, awesome. Uh, I'm going to buy some Warhammer today. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what, Cargill, or you could head on over to Patreon.com. Patreon.com slash Night Attack. Yeah, yeah, that's where we support this very show. Uh, we make sure that you guys get 
fresh episodes, even when I'm out of the country, which I am right now. That's why we are recording these, so you guys keep having fresh content every single Tuesday night. Hey, by the way, uh, are you guys enjoying all of this together in the same studio stuff that's been happening? Guess what? That is paid for by the fantastic patrons over at patreon.com slash night attack. Wait, wait, you guys are making money off this? Uh, shh, I mean, we're not keeping you, much. You, you brought me a glass of water. And man. by the way, there's no arbitration here. There's no arbitration. I want credit on this episode. No, this is a non-union is shop. Get the fuck out. <laughs> oh shit, I'm not allowed to work on non-union. <laughs> I'm in a lot of fucking trouble here. <laughs> uh, hey, normally we do the name chant corner hour and we do a, the, the, the bit boss and all that stuff. But since this is a banked episode, I uh, hope you guys are all <laughs> enjoying it. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, here's a name. Cargill. Body. Cargill. Oh, Cargill. 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 That's <laughs> it's a good solution. Uh, <laughs> all right. I got to pivot here for you. Let's pivot. I love that segue, by the way. It was eight years ago. Oh, boy. That you were on. I guess it was is it NSFW show, right? Yeah. Yeah. NSFW show. I've been doing this a lot of years with you guys. A long yeah. time. A, lot a of, long time. A lot of bad calls during summer. Uh, <laughs> I was about to, I was, I, in my mental file of facts, uh, when I see Cargill, I think uh, the, the C stands for crappy at the movie drafts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Remember, remember this go, we go so far back. There was a time where my big play was going Green all in Lantern. on Green Lantern. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'd heard a rumor that it was good, and that oh. was incorrect. All right, so uh, uh, Bryce, do you have the official date on this? Yeah, this is via the DC TVpedia from NSFW episode 104 in the after show uh, from November uh, 29, 2011 to November 2012, uh, instigated by Justin Robert Young, accepted by Brian Brushwood <laughs> and C. Robert Cargo. Justin bets that Mitt Romney will win the 2012 presidential election and will do so by more than 5%. Wow. Those are <laughs> those are uh, those are good stakes. Well, the uh, thing is, is so I bet each of you a stake. It was the two stake McGee bet. <laughs> and uh, and what happened, what this was, what was interesting was at the time Romney was not the nominee and no. was not thought to be the Romney, not the Romney. <laughs> the the Romney. Romney. And we were like, "No, fuck that. That's bullshit." He's definitely the nominee. Yes. Nobody knows it yet. He's gonna outperform all these sick ponies. There's no no one else. He's gonna get in. And then I'm like, but he's gonna lose to Obama. And you were like, no, oh, he's gonna clobber Obama. And so we went back and forth for a while talking about why. Yeah. And as it turns out, I was right. Yes, and I had to, and then uh, Brian got in on the bet action. <laughs> he like, let, he let, he were so he let, somebody give me like <laughs> free steaks. He let Cargill <laughs> pave the way, and then he's like, "Yep, I'm on the Cargill team." <laughs> Uh, and so I, at a South by Southwest after the election, had to uh, uh, not only foot the bill, but uh, then also, as Cargill just went down the list of sides that he'd wanted on, <laughs> on his thing. It's like, yeah, I'll take the mushroom and the spinach and, and the, the, the bacon the wrap. onions. Yeah. Oh, it was, that was a wonderful fucking steak. It was a great So, so uh, uh, you guys want to re-up on the steak bets? Well, you it know, listen, like steak, at that steak. point, I was, you know, eight years ago, just a, a, a random dude who was interested in politics. Now... I am an uh, uh, independent political analyst. Uh, uh, I now make my living doing it. I, I ask you, is there anything you feel uh, really, really uh, solid on going forward to the 2020 election? You know what? I did for a while, and now seeing some recent numbers, I don't. What I, what I do feel solid on is... Um, uh, and I know from inside stuff is that, first of all, uh, Republicans are going to lose hard everywhere. And if if there is no weird last minute coup for the presidency um, uh, uh, and Trump does, in fact, run and doesn't decide not to run um, they're uh, they're going to lose the Senate. Um, and uh, the Democrats are it definitely is, it going is, it to is, keep it is, it is a favorable map. It is, it is a favorable senatorial it, it's map. It's a favorable senatorial yeah. map in a normal year. But the thing is, is that the Democrat, the, what the big Trump legacy is going to be that um, uh, he shifted the demographic for two generations. Like his presidency has so galvanized millennials and generation uh, or, and um uh, uh, and uh, Gen Y or Gen, Gen Z, Z yeah. Gen Z has so galvanized New them voters, yes. to the left and taught them how important it is to vote that Republicans are never in 
in, in uh, the current iteration's lifetime going to retake power like they did. Like this is this is essentially we are at we are at 1929 where the Republicans have so many governorships, they have the House, they have the Senate, they have yeah. the the um, the presidency, and they're going to lose it for 50 years. Um, and we're going to, if you remember, the the Republicans never had Congress for 50 years. It was always not. the yeah. Democrats. The first thing the Democrats are going to do with this big election win is push through their uh, um, their anti-corruption bill. They're going to destabilize all of the various uh, gerrymandering that's happened, and that's going to completely redraw the um, the congressional map for decades. And so um, we are going to go back into a liberal era where then the big question is: is do we be uh, is the Democratic Party going to remain progressive, or are we going to see that um, that disparate uh, neoliberal group manage to hold on? and grab hold. And that's what I'm really curious about. Up until recently, I was pretty confident that it was probably going to be either Kamala Harris or um, uh, Elizabeth Warren with Beto as um, the VP pick. Uh, Uh But man, people are stupid about Biden. And they there's like he's like currently in the straw polls. He's running at 38 percent. And yeah. the nearest person is Warren with like now 15. that that is that. I mean, at the point that we were recording this, that's we're within a week of him announcing. So he, he is getting these are the I first he, polls. Yeah, since, yeah, yeah. Since he announced. So he was going to get some kind of bounce. But really, the bigger shift has been the the ebbing of uh, uh, Kamala Harris and of Bernie Sanders. Like that that is where some of that's coming from, at least now. Now, I've been on record as saying that I I believe that Bernie will get the nomination. Really? I do. Uh, mostly because I think he, A, I don't believe in Biden. Uh, I think that Biden has a legacy of uh, flaming out and flaming out early. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, at the point that we're recording this, he's made one major stump speech and he slurred his way through it. And yeah. when you are as old as Joe Biden is, that I think that that's, that stacks up. Because at some point, people are that he's already the front runner, and so people are already attacking him for a lot of different things. There's going to be a point in which somebody puts together the super cut of all the slurs, uh, and it's, it's not going to look good for him. And, yeah. and that more than him, and that's before we get to the point where He's going to step on his dick so hard that it falls off, which is normally the Joe Biden way of running for president. And that's and and fingers crossed, because the thing is, is, you know, he's the wrong person for 2020. Like uh, Joe Biden, was, you know, uh, has done a lot of good for this country. He served his country, but he's the he's the wrong person to shepherd us into this new era. And it's and the thing is, I love Bernie Sanders. Uh, I've always loved Bernie Sanders. Bernie Bernie's uh, always been an interesting uh, politician. But watching one watching one sunsetting president made me very nervous about hiring a seventy eight year old for the job. Sure, sure. I mean that's the thing. And so now, if I I I believe that Bernie's going to get the nomination because I think that nobody else has the hardcore support that he has, and in a wide field, and in a wide field that matters. It mattered for Trump in twenty sixteen. I think it's going to matter for Bernie going forward as everybody's attacking everybody. Nobody has that hardcore. We'll never leave twenty yeah. percent the way that Bernie has that hardcore twenty yeah. percent. So the question then is, against Trump, is he the guy if the economy uh, uh, keeps going the way that it's going? Oh, so absolutely, far? absolutely. Uh, oh, no way, no way. It's it's if if, if un, unless there is a uh, a nine eleven between now and the election, even it, then it will be it will be Trump. Nothing yet. It, it, Trump is going to win uh, because because no. in general, yeah, we we are. Does that smell like steak? <laughs> it smells oh, like steak. Are, 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 are we, we on, I'll I'll take, like steak? Are we on the same? Bet. I'll take that bet all day and all night. Okay. No, the thing is, is that he, you know, Trump, Trump cannot. Trump on his best weeks. <laughs> this is why Trump will win is because people go apop- apoplectic about the idea no, of it. No, <laughs> Trump on his best weeks can't get over 40 percent approval. People are not. My parents who voted for him the first time will not get out, go out of their house to vote for him again. They they feel they they are feel nothing but anger and shame repeatedly it, for being lumped in with the people that really do love him. Yes to all of that. Yes to all of that. But if there is one candidate that can inspire fear in in the in 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 the, in the hearts of 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 
conservative leaning uh, f- fiscal conservatives, it would be Bernie Sanders. So if mm. Bernie Sanders, I, this is my if then, if Bernie Sanders, then Trump absolutely wins because his rhetoric is uh, uh, is is far too strong on uh, wealth distribution. Well, because I, I think yeah, I the, 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 the the idea is is I do think that your your baseline assumptions are correct that mm-hmm. there is a large uh, drive specifically in the states that would turn the map uh, to say I would like somebody but Trump and that's why you're seeing the Biden support now because Biden is wouldn't it be nice to go back to the Obama administration right. look at me I'm the Obama stand in yeah let's let's go back to Republican light instead of uh, yeah. Republican uh, now, evil but, now it, the it, question is who, it's who, like, who it, is Republican light and it's not Bernie Sanders that's no, the problem I mean you know who it might be Mayor Pete. I'm bullish on Mayor Pete. Really? I am bullish on Mayor Pete. Yeah. He's a uh, he's a weird one. I mean, he's got a lot going for him. My mom loves him. My mom, as soon as she saw Mayor Pete, she became the number one, you know, writer of Mayor Pete fan fiction. I uh, there's one reason I don't want Mayor Pete. And, uh-huh. and it's my only reason is I can already see all of the terrible names that Republicans will then call him for four years. And I, I, really I, I think that would be a that. disastrous uh, misplay on the part of Republicans. And if they do. Oh, yeah, then... because you know what they've been really good at is playing the game properly for the last few years. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> you know what? They, uh, as somebody. Well, who I mean, was... number, number one, number one, political nicknames are almost universally terrible. Right. Yes, but like. We have gotten into I, one of the things that needs to be said for those that don't know my backstory. I was a Republican for most of my life. So yeah. all of this is not left leaning, you know, Hollywood liberal claptrap. This is I grew up in a conservative family. I was uh, I was going to become a priest uh, when I was in high school. I uh, uh, I have supported Republicans. I have several good prominent all, Republican all of friends. these are true. Also, keep in mind, this is coming from the guy who picked Green Lantern and bought some really delicious steaks. Whoa, whoa. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. When it comes to the movie picks, and that, <laughs> my political uh, my political stuff has been pretty spot on. The only time I was really ever wrong in my political predictions was I predicted Bernie Sanders in 2016, but I did not anticipate how much the DNC would cheat and that they would then be so shamelessly defend their cheating. Like that was, I, I still hold that if that were a fairly run election and the DNC did their job, Bernie Sanders would have actually gotten the nomination and would be president now. Uh, but I could be wrong. I mean, I was wrong about that pick, but uh, I've actually called it multiple times before. When it comes to politics, I'm good at that it's why i'm so curious right now because i don't have a strong inclination on who it is and it's the first time in 20 years i haven't known who the democrat was going to be because i always knew it years out you know in 2005 we talked about this on steak bet night in 2005 yeah. i was like uh the next the, the next uh election is going to be mccain and obama and everyone's like who's barack obama and i'm like he's the guy that gave that speech yeah. in 2004 you're like and, like and it's not going to be john mccain the republicans will never nominate john mccain i'm like you just watch and there it was and this is the first time and i knew i was going to be romney obama in 2012 uh, i did not see trump coming but i did not know who the republicans were going to be because uh, as my wife famously said wow they really trotted out the sick ponies like there was no yeah. there was no good pick in 2016 for anyone r.i.p jeb <laughs> jeb yeah <laughs> please clap <laughs> please clap <laughs> please clap oh did by the way sidebar um uh did you guys see the great please laugh moment of uh zuckerberg this week no. Uh-oh. Oh, he was doing a thing where he's on stage and he's telling what he thinks is a joke. It's like, yeah, no, I know. Um, uh, oh wait, Bryce, could you look this yeah, up? Yeah, he's on it. He's on yeah, it. He's so on it. I'll, I'll just, I'll let show the moment and you can watch the look on his face uh, that it, you want him to see. Please laugh. But the, uh, uh, the moment where he actually, here, yeah, here we go. I was gonna let you guys stew in it. All right. This is from, I guess, a Facebook announcement earlier this week. Or, or three weeks ago. I know that we don't exactly have the, the strongest reputation on privacy right now, to put it lightly. <laughs> but I'm committed. What's great? What's great is he's doing all this with with a uh, what you presume to be a, what what a human would perform as a self-deprecating grin, and then you can see as, as like end subroutine human self-deprecation <laughs> yeah. commence business. You get to watch him die inside at the end. It's great. I, I know that we don't exactly have the the strongest reputation on privacy right now. To put it lightly. 
Oh Leave room God. for love. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Leave Can room you for imagine what's despair. what's in what's in the teleprompter? Like, yeah. Right. Right. Pause, pause for, for laughter. <laughs> oh, that I just saw that. I'm like, it's the new. Please clap. Oh, yeah, to put it lightly. Is Wait, and, and isn't that just as he's about to announce that everybody should whisper their secret crush to to Facebook? Uh, yeah. The guys F8, about F8 conference. The new secret crushes come into Facebook dating. Oh. oh, so you can like list who your secret crush is, and then that factors into the all well, powerful you, algorithm. Hey man, you tell it what friends you have you. crushes on, and if they have compatible crushes, then it'll tell you. Otherwise, it keeps it. It won't tell you. But I mean, um, sure that doesn't cool sound group. easily yeah. gameable. Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 uh, everybody's my crush. Oh. Yeah, no, no, it's the, the it's the swipe Tinder. right. Yeah, yeah. literally yeah. policy. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just swipe everyone and see who swipes me. <clears throat> uh, so, so wait, well, hold on. Wait. Yeah, stake. All right, so so what what are the terms here on this stake bet? Well, the term because because what what I what I took back then was Romney plus or minus five before before any of the 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 the, the primaries or the caucuses, I took Romney minus five. Are you willing to take a Democratic candidate minus five against Donald Trump in twenty twenty? Oh, easily. Yeah, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I will take any. De- I will take any Democrat. No, no, you have to name well, it. Well, yeah, you have to I mean, name it. Like no, I no, know, but yeah, no, no. Well, no. What I'm saying is, I would any Democrat would beat Trump by five. I, okay, so do you want to bet one stake per candidate? I'll take as many stakes as you want to lay out. Well, here. The thing is, is, I don't. The thing is, in well, terms it's of twenty stake stakes. Bet, well, I'll be eating. I don't. Steaks I don't. I don't, you for I don't a year. know. I don't know where the electorate's gonna go um for this nominee the, the 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 issue that democrats have right now is is very different than last time <clears throat> in that they have a wealth of great candidates like you know um i think kamala harris would be a great president i think and she, what she would do like she's the person i want sitting across from putin right now like she is the toughest candidate we have um i think beto uh is going to make a great vice president and get that um he's an empty suit the, I, really? I, no, I, I think he could do on the job training for, if he gets uh, eight years. Really? Then. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm bearish on Beto. I think that he benefited a lot from the fact that a lot of people don't like Ted Cruz. He could play his own inauguration. That's a uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, yeah, he, yeah, he'd yeah, he be the first time. Yeah, yeah, at, at, at the drive-in at yeah. the inauguration. I think I, uh, I think Bernie Sanders. You know, uh, as if he is, Bernie, Bernie, I believe if it. his if his health stays, which is something he, that cannot be controlled. I, I I will say that he has done an exceptional job of having a very very fast mind, a very fast uh, mm-hmm. responses, and if he could continue to to outshine everyone like that, well, I mean, that's, I could totally see him sealing the the primary. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is, uh, you know, John McCain kept that all the way through. You know, yeah. John was on John was on chemo and was failing, and I sat and had beers with him, and he was sharp and funny as ever um uh he you know uh so i think bernie could be that same way but I, but that's the only question mark with bernie right. i think it'd be great i think elizabeth warren would do a great job and and w- what her presidency would be about would be equally as important as several of the others um so we just have so many good choices to so bernie minus five or Biden. Minus right, five. Well, well, I, I think. I think. Here, look. Uh, uh, hello is the adjudicator of the stake. Yeah. Uh, stake arbitrate. Bet. Arbitrate uh, yeah. the stake. Bet. Uh, what What Justin wants now. Listen. I know what you want, Justin. Yeah. Is you want one primary winner and the final tally on whether or not yes. they take the presidency. Yeah. That sounds like a little too steep for his confidence. Would you okay. take three potentials and a final result? Because he's. We, we all. I'll guys, take. I'll take three. If he can narrow it down to three, I'll take three. All right. So, 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 so the win condition is: uh, first of all, I assume that you're saying that Trump is going to win. I believe, and it I'm going. I'm be... going. I'm going to bet on the house. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. And it, but so, but and you are convinced that a Democrat will win. So you get to oh, pick yeah. three Democrats, and one of those three has to uh, clinch the primary and then win the presidency, and then then the stake bet will be complete. Also, uh, I'm already like whatever you say. I'm with Justin as well. I'll take us uh, if you want to double your stakes. Oh, all right. Wow, two stakes. Two stakes. <laughs> Jesus. That's going to be. That's Imagine gonna, the size. That's going to be. A, <laughs> You're just going to get the whole menu. Delicious <laughs> dinner. Um, yeah, no, you can that's fools. Fools. Uh, all right, my I'll, the three I'll take. Uh, you know what? I'll go Bernie Biden Warren. I think. Uh, BBW. Bernie Biden Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you guys got I love there. Bryce <laughs> snickering over. The BBW bet. <laughs> the BBW bet has been set. Oh. A firm oh shake, handshake. shake, 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 shake. Ah, there we go. 
oh, man, you guys are going to lose steaks for Donald Trump. You know how <laughs> delicious that's going to be? All right, like, you know what? We're, we're going to do If we win, we're going to insist that you dig up the Trump steaks. <laughs> Nope, because these are going to be good steaks. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's really really go. Count on fucking horse meat. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I mean, th- really, there's there's nothing that I I I don't particularly believe in the uh, electoral strength of Donald Trump. I, I do believe that in a good economy, uh, that the drive to say anybody but Trump will be complicated by I who I believe is Bernie Sanders is is going to be, and then it also comes with. Whether or not I want to keep the, my health insurance, and whether or not the, I want to, but that's the that's the problem is people are basing this uh, looking at the economy and talking about the economy, and the problem with the economy is no matter how good the economy is, uh, we are leaking jobs. You know, we are we have a very serious problem in which automation is robbing a number of careers. So why don't you take Yang? Why aren't you in the Yang gang? Yang Gang's talking about this. Yeah, but you, but nobody's ready to talk about this yet. This is the stuff that needs to be talked about in the back rooms. People aren't ready to discuss. Uh, uh, are, are, are you down with UBI? Oh, yeah. In fact, I here's here's my crazy 10-year outstake bet. Okay. UBI is going to be the Republican answer in 10 years. Uh, I believe that, especially if they position it. Uh, the, the neat thing about uh, Universal UBI basic is that income it's a— for those. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the neat thing about uh, uh, UBI is that it's this perfect Rorschach test where everybody can see what they want in it. I know on the libertarian side of things, uh, people are super thrilled at the idea of like uh, instead of the government saying uh, you can have this money if you get a job and do this type of thing, it's like that's more government interference than we want. Like, uh, and same thing with like you know you got to spend your healthcare money this way. Uh, UBI solves all that, where it's just like, hey man, here's here's money, do whatever you want that, with it. That that presumes that they'll wind down other programs. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but it's enough to get to, to get like you know libertarians and fiscal conservatives really interested in it as as a re- replacement option but uh, uh yeah I, i'll take that stake bet uh, there you will not be seeing ubi uh in 10 years no no talking about it that will be their oh, answer wait, to wait, the problem oh I oh, oh got it got it yeah no no the thing is is that we're we're gonna see a massive we're going to see a massive shift in the Republican Party after 2020, um, I mean, we're already we're seeing what we're seeing is the last gasps of the kind of conservatism that we grew up with. We're going to see a very different uh, way it's taking. We're seeing the Democratic Party going uh, uh, throwing out um, neoliberalism and embracing uh, uh, progressiveness very, very intensely. We've got two generations growing up with progressive heroes that want progressive policies, and they're going to go further to the left. It's one of the things. Um, the, the the sliding scale of politics, you know, you've got your people on the the right and you got your people on the left. Um, as one moves, the other follows. So as the right went more to the right, the left followed and went more to the right, and we had neoliberalism. Now that the left is pulling to the left, you're watching Republicans go, well, 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 but, 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 and making the compromises, and they're moving to the left now. So we're going to see. But I would, I would argue that Donald Trump was part of that leftward migration. Well, part, uh, partly, but he also triggered it. Like he's, sure. yeah, you know. Um, and the thing is, is but that I mean, he was, he is the most liberal Republican president of the last several decades. If you can believe that liberal fascism is a thing, yeah. Um, I mean, just in terms of like that, he's previously been for gun control and healthcare. Sure. Well, yeah, and, but not yeah. now. Like, net, I mean, his policies in office, like whatever he talked about beforehand, isn't what he's running, and he's running a very different game. He's not running a liberal Republican party. He's running. Mm-hmm. He's no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, but I think honestly, I don't think the. So what I'm saying here is, I don't think the economy, although although I, do, I, I is I, going I, to benefit him the way people think it is. I think that's a prognosticator thing. That it's an indicator that has worked in the past, but the changing landscape of how politics is working in this day and age, that is no longer going to benefit him. People going, I have a job. Yeah, I have a job, and I've got a president who's under investigation and is literally going to lose most of his wealth to back taxes to the state of New York. Um, like. I'm we're we're sick of this. We need something else. And I don't think I again, I, I think I think you're totally right that that there's a lot of people that want them out. I think it's the, the question of what the alternative comes with and, and whether or not that's enough to get it over. But we've already made the bet. Well, nope. and, <laughs> and no back <backseat>. <laughs> uh, uh The only other point is uh, whatever Democratic candidate uh, comes in. Um, I mean, I guess we we did see enough mobilization of the youth with uh, under Obama, but like if Bernie Sanders uh, is the 
candidate, then I think there's enough fear in everybody over the age of 50 uh, about uh, uh, losing their money or their taxes or whatever uh, that I, I feel like they would swallow the bitter pill of, of just like more of whatever's well, currently out there. Bernie, Bernie does mobilize the kids. I, when I was out in, in Des Moines for the caucus in 2016, like I was there at the Bernie Sanders campaign headquarters and it was like a college party where the professor's the coolest guy there. Now like it was it was a it was a scene. See you t you, you talk about that the old people fear. However, did you guys see the did you watch the Bernie Sanders um, the, the, the Fox News thing? Yeah. Oh yeah, he he killed it. He crushed it. And that that moment, that moment where Brett Baer uh asks the audience. Well, let's ask the audience, which he knows was stacked with fucking Republicans. Like, there was a college kid who stood up and said, hi, I'm a college student from... It's like, no, you're actually a conservative activist that uh, that uh, uh, that makes a living working for a conservative group in college. Yes. Yeah. I mean, but, yeah. so town, it's, town halls are shams. It's stacked. And then Brett Baer says, how many of you would give up your current health care uh, in exchange for uh, uh, Medicare for all, and almost all the hands go up, and the audience starts cheering. And Brett Bear's just like a deer in headlights. He's like, "Wait, wait, what?" And it's like, "Oh yes." As it turns out, um, seventy percent of this country wants Medicare for all. So that's when that's what he's talking about. That's not going to scare people into. Um, that's not going to scare people away from voting for him. The people who are going to vote against him, we're already going to go out and vote against him. Oh, man, so for the audio listeners, uh, we, we we got some surprised looks. No, on I mean, Justin's I, face. I, I would, <laughs> I, I think it is more like there is the made-for-television spectacle of uh, a, a town hall. Uh, I, I don't know if when the rubber meets the road, if that's going to be the case. But well, but the, I mean, the latest, the latest again. I, I I believe I believe in Bernie uh, going as far as. Election night. I, I I believe in him as a candidate. I believe that is uh, that it is time that America wants these progressive ideas to have a moment. So uh, let me just be clear here. We're gonna have two nights in a row where one of you buys me a steak and sure. then we go out. Again. However you want. I, However you want. It's because it's kind of it's kind of cheap to just order two steaks and <laughs> there, cram them down. I, I mean, think. you could. We could. We could make a day of it. It'd just be a luxurious uh, a five hour experience. Go into a meat can... coma. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Cargill, if you had anything to promote that you are allowed to talk about in public, yeah. what would it be? Uh, you know what? I have two podcasts I'm really proud of. Uh, one I've been doing for a long time. It's called Junk Food Cinema. Uh, which, by the way, I would love to come back and visit you again. On. Yeah, I'd love to have you guys on. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, me and a buddy talk for an hour uh, about uh, uh, a classic uh, cult exploitation film or a film that we don't think gets uh, uh, a lot of love. Um, Great podcast. Yeah. And uh, then I recently started up a podcast with Dave Chen uh, called Write Along, which uh, is 10 to 20 minutes a week of writing advice. And people write in and ask questions. Oh, and I, I saw some of these. Uh, uh, this looks fantastic. I, I, I love the, the, the topics that you guys are Yeah, covering. the thing is, is I started, I, I almost abandoned social media entirely. I'm just sick of, you know, the hellscape that it's kind of become. And so I just started, you know, like answering some questions and giving some advice. And people really responded to it. And people have really responded to me giving writing advice on a daily basis. And it is great. It is great writing advice. Follow and, Cargill on Twitter. And people said, you should write a book. And I'm like, I've got so much to write right now, and I really don't want to charge people for this advice. So uh, Dave Chen came out of the woodwork and goes, would you want to do it as a podcast? And I said, yeah. Like, that sounds easy. That sounds. But the thing is, is because you're supposed to be writing, let's make it short and to the point, 10, 20 minute episodes, a little bit of advice on each thing. And we're covering a whole mess of topics. Uh, we've been doing it for six months now. It's a lot of fun. People have really dug it. And so if uh, one of those things uh, floats your boat, definitely, definitely uh, check that out. And that's uh, uh, on Twitter at M-A-S-S-A-W-Y-R-M, -S -S right? That is correct. Mass Nailed of Nailed it. Uh, dude, thanks so much for hanging with us. Thanks, Ladies and gentlemen, C. Robert Cargill. Bye, guys. Uh, I guess do we play the lullaby? Uh, sure. Let's. Okay, there we hey, go. Hey, there's a lullaby. Hey, man, what, 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 what did we learn, Justin? Oh, Jesus Christ. We learned that uh, we, we got, we got, we got steaks on the line, <laughs> <Yeah>. baby. <laughs> and delicious, good steaks. delicious steaks. <laughs> uh, uh, we learned that, uh, uh, hot damn, your unbridled enthusiasm for all of the fanboy elements uh, that made you the writer that you are uh, continue unabated. We learned that uh, Robert Gale's a thirsty motherfucker when he sees that money out there. <laughs>
Uh, but most importantly, we learned that we can do a bank show, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. So uh, we'll, we'll see you guys next. We learned that 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 that, that, that you, we can possibly go on vacations. Hey, that's a thing. Bonjour, no. <laughs> Thanks again to all the fantastic patrons. We love you guys. Do us a favor. Die in a fire. See you next Tuesday. Oh, Justin Robert Young. Every time you go, I get so sad that I wanna drink a warm glass of Drano. Night attack, night attack, night attack, night attack. Night attack. Night attack. Night attack. Night attack. Night attack. Night attack, I love you. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>